In Science Survey, today and also next week, Dr. Charles Vernon speaks about the chemical theories of the origin of life. This week, he discusses the conditions that he believes would have been necessary before life could begin evolving on the Earth. In recent years, the origin of life has become a respectable scientific problem. Books, conferences, radio programs are now devoted to it. In this and in next week's talk, I want to examine the kind of problem involved and to discuss whether any real progress has been made with it. Biological evolution implies a point of origin in time. At some time in the remote past, the first organism, presumably a simple single cell creature, appeared. Since this must have been an exceedingly rare event, and if we assume for the moment no extraterrestrial source of life, then all existing living creatures have evolved from that single cell. Can we estimate when this happened? Fossil remains are plentiful back to Cambrian times, about 600 million years ago. At this point, life was already well advanced. Most existing invertebrate types, for example, can be recognized in fossil forms originating from this period. So our point of origin is more remote than this. Fossil remains older than Cambrian are few, and what we really have to do is to guess by a somewhat wild extrapolation how long life had existed before the Cambrian period. We believe the Earth to be about 6,000 million years old. Since presumably its original form was unsuitable for life, our point of origin cannot be as remote as this. If we take a sort of midway point and suppose that for about half the Earth's existence no life existed, we shall not be doing undue violence to what little evidence we have. We shall assume then that about 3,000 million years ago the first living creatures were formed and that they formed spontaneously from inanimate material. The problems involved by this assumption can be reduced to three questions. What happened? Can we explain it? And could it happen again? Life is characterized by immense chemical complexity. For such chemical complexity to arise by chance is necessarily improbable. We can make it plausible only by assuming that the period of organic evolution, which happened after life appeared, was preceded by a period of chemical evolution in which increasingly complicated molecules formed. We can construct the following sequence. First, we start with the very simple molecules contained in the Earth's atmosphere. Then we suppose more complex organic molecules could be formed, amino acids, sugars, and so on, containing perhaps a few dozen atoms. From these complex molecules of the protein and nucleic acid types and containing thousands of atoms might be formed. These large molecules might then associate together to form semi-organized structures. From these, given sufficient time, a living cell might arise. This picture presupposes that there existed over a long period of time a complicated mixture of organic molecules of the type now known to be involved in biochemical processes, plus natural catalysts such as clays and that from this mixture, the organization of a living cell arose by chance. One must imagine this mixture to have been present in some shallow sea or primitive ocean. We might call it the primeval soup, and theories involving it we might call primeval soup theories. Most contemporary speculation has been concerned with the composition of this soup, with finding ways in which it could be formed. Unfortunately, the problem is made more difficult 
because it is not known exactly how the Earth, or any other planet, was formed. And consequently, it is difficult to decide which chemicals were originally present in the Earth's atmosphere and on its surface. I'll avoid this problem and content myself with the view that at some stage in the evolution of the Earth, it possessed an atmosphere which contained no oxygen. The evidence for this is good, although of course we do not know what the precise composition of this atmosphere was. Probably it contained volatile carbon compounds, such as methane and possibly ammonia. The mechanism of conversion of this atmosphere into the present one is obscure. Some scientists believe that free oxygen is entirely biological in origin and that it arose after the emergence of photosynthetic life on Earth. Whatever the truth of this may be, there is no doubt that our primeval soup was formed in a predominantly reducing atmosphere. Now, one of the few experimental facts available in this field is that from such an atmosphere and given a continuous energy supply in the form of solar radiation, a whole variety of simple organic molecules can be formed. Miller, in America, showed, for example, that by passing a high voltage electric spark through a mixture of hydrogen, methane and ammonia in the presence of water, he could detect at the end of the experiment several simple organic acids, urea, and what was more important, several amino acids. Our proteins are made of amino acids, essentially joined together to form a polymer. And so this observation of Miller's is important. A great deal has been made of these and other similar experiments, possibly because, as I've said, they represent the sum total of experimental facts at present available. But it must be noted that no one, to my knowledge, has succeeded in producing, under primeval soup conditions, the other necessary small molecules, in particular sugars and nitrogen-containing compounds called purines. Nevertheless, small organic molecules could have been formed from the chemicals available on the primitive Earth. And it is reasonable to suppose that they were, even though the precise mechanisms involved remain obscure. The next stage in increasing chemical complexity, the production of proteins and nucleic acids, is harder to imagine. Proteins are large molecules containing amino acid residues condensed together. A small protein, like insulin, for example, contains some 50 such residues. Larger proteins contain many hundreds. Nucleic acids are, in general, even larger molecules, containing sugar residues, purine or pyrimidine residues, linked together through a phosphate group in a rather complicated way. Now, in living organisms, proteins and nucleic acids are the most important molecules involved. The nucleic acids probably contain the genetic information and control the synthesis of proteins. Proteins, in turn, control the chemical reactions that take place in living tissue. Life, as we know it, cannot exist without molecules of these two types. If life on our planet came from chance combinations occurring in a primeval soup, then nucleic acids and proteins must have been present. But it is difficult at the moment to see how either type of substance could be formed in any quantity. There is a further difficulty which has plagued all writers in this field and has made some decide that the whole problem is impossible. Now, this arises in the following way. Any given amino acid, say glutamic acid, exists in two molecular forms. One is the mirror image of the other, so that the relationship between them is like that between 
a right hand glove and a left hand glove. Any chemical synthesis of an amino acid or of any other substance which can exist in a left or right hand form always gives equal amounts of the two forms. But the amino acids in proteins are entirely of one form, let us say the left hand form. It is extremely difficult to see how this can have arisen. The amino acids produced in Miller's experiments were inevitably equal mixtures of the two possible kinds, and this one would think would also have been true of the primeval soup. An apparent paradox is involved. Preponderance of left-handed amino acids is a necessary condition for life, but such a situation could only arise in the presence of life. There are two ways of avoiding this paradox. One is to assume that certain factors other than life were originally present which favoured one particular form of amino acid. Two such factors have been suggested. One involves the Earth's magnetic field and the other involves the asymmetry of natural quartz crystals. I shall not go into the details of either. Sufficient to say that although a preponderance of one form of amino acid could have arisen by such means, it seems that the effect would always have been very small and cannot explain our problem. The other way out is to assume that the existence of proteins containing only one form of the amino acids is itself a product of biochemical evolution. In other words, that for reasons we do not yet understand, such molecules give a biological advantage to organisms, and that the earliest molecules were not so constituted. This may well be true. Indeed, the right-hand form of amino acids does occur in nature. It has not been totally excluded. Let us leave this aspect of the problem and suppose that the difficulties notwithstanding, a complex mixture of proteins and nucleic acids arose spontaneously at some time in the remote past. We now have to imagine how chance combinations of molecules could give rise to a primitive cell. In fact, the difficulties of this step are far greater than those that we have already discussed. There has been an unfortunate tendency particularly among chemists and physicists, to think that having got to large molecules, the rest of the way is all downhill. Any living organism must have a complex membrane and a complex internal structure. And what is more, it must organize its chemical reactions in such a way that it is not in energy equilibrium, or more precisely, not in thermodynamic equilibrium with its surroundings. So there must be many intermediate stages between mixtures of large molecules and microorganisms. Now one of these may be the so-called coacivate drops. Now let me explain what these are. It has been discovered that certain mixtures of large molecules, for example mixtures of starch, and gelatin, and another substance called protamine sulfate, will form drops which have great stability and which will scavenge and absorb other molecules from solution. Further, in the presence of fats, or lipids as the chemist calls them, the drops may surround themselves with a fatty layer, which is reminiscent of a cell membrane. Now, were these coacivate drops the forerunners of living cells? At least it seems certain that if large molecules form spontaneously, then coacivate drops would certainly occur. Even so, the jump from these drops to a living cell is still unimaginably large. That science survey on the chemical theories of the origins of life was the first of two talks given by Dr. Charles Vernon of University College London. In science survey last week, and also tonight, Dr. Charles Vernon speaks about the chemical theories of the origin of life. In this second talk, he follows up what he said about chemical evolution 
with an analysis of the prerequisites of even the simple living cell. In my talk last time, I discussed the idea that organic evolution, the evolution of living creatures, had been preceded by a period of chemical evolution resulting in the production of complex molecules such as nucleic acids and proteins. We saw that such molecules might aggregate together to form the so-called coacivate drops and that these show certain superficial similarities to living cells. Now no one has yet given a plausible account of how the transition from a coacivate drop to a living cell occurred. The difficulties with this step are much greater than all the difficulties I discussed last time. The point is that any recognizably living cell has a very complex organization. This is only very imperfectly understood, but it appears to involve the following main features. First, there must be some structure which can copy itself and which carries a store of information relating to which chemical events are to go on inside the cell. We think that this function is carried out in all cells by a particular kind of nucleic acid, deoxyribose nucleic acid, usually called simply DNA. Secondly, there must be a complex set of chemical reactions organized so that the energy obtained from the controlled breakdown of foodstuffs can be used by the cell to build its body substance and to maintain its essential activities. This is done by special catalytic proteins called enzymes. The way in which these enzymes, which are themselves produced under the ultimate control of DNA, are organized into chemical networks is only known in outline. But enough is known to make it clear that the minimum enzymic organization required for a free living existence is very complex. Finally, the cell must be surrounded by a membrane. This is not, as is sometimes popularly supposed, merely a bag which keeps the essential works together. It must have certain active properties of its own. It must let through some substances and not others. Its essential function is to maintain the chemical composition inside the cell roughly constant, whatever the outside medium might be. And at the same time, it must allow essential foodstuffs in and waste matter out. These, then, are the essential features of a living cell. What we have to believe is that such a structure arose from chance combinations of molecules present in the primeval soup. Now, this obviously is perfectly possible in principle. Given enough time, a monkey randomly striking the keys of a typewriter must produce a copy of Hamlet. Similarly, given the right mixture of molecules and a supply of energy, a living cell will eventually arise by chance. But have we enough time to play with? We can calculate the probability of producing a copy of Hamlet by randomly striking the keys of a typewriter. The answer comes out that the probability is so low that we should certainly not expect Hamlet to have been produced by such means within the lifetime of the Earth. We cannot, unfortunately, do a similar calculation for the probability of producing a living cell by chance combinations of complex molecules. But intuitively, one feels that the probability must be very low. If, for a moment, we accept this, there are three attitudes we can take. First, we can say, well, that's how it happened. Let's not worry about it anymore. The fact that we're here proves that it happened so that undue skepticism is pointless. The second traditional attitude is to invoke an extra factor. This might be called vital force or simply God. Now, the trouble with this move is that it doesn't help. I am not, of course, challenging the idea of God in general, but only pointing out that the introduction of any supernatural agency in this context is equivalent to giving the problem up and refusing to do any more experiments. From the scientist's point of view, and we must, of course, stress that this is the point of view that we're considering, such a move would simply block further progress in the field by removing the essential feature into the realm of the unknowable. The third attitude 
is to believe that life did not, in fact, originate on Earth at all, but came from outside. The virtue of this move is that, in principle, it increases the possible time available for chance combinations of molecules to give rise to a living organism. Its disadvantage is that it puts the place of origin of life and the conditions under which life arose outside our observation. This theory has had many supporters in the past and has recently been revived in connection with the so-called microfossils found in certain kinds of meteorites. Briefly, the position is this. Certain meteorites appear on microscopic examination to contain organized structures. These structures might have been produced biologically. In other words, they may be fossilized remains of living cells. If they are, then they almost certainly came from outside the Earth. And then one has to face the possibility that life did not originate on and may be older than the Earth. The scientific journal Nature has just published an account of recent investigations and an interesting appraisal of the present position by Professor J.D. Burnell. My own view of this controversial subject is that these investigations will not materially affect our main problem. It will be very difficult to prove that these structures really are fossils. And even if they are, this will not necessarily mean that life did not originate on Earth. It might simply mean that life has also occurred elsewhere. Now let me summarize the main conclusions so far. The problem involves a process in which complexity gradually increases. The sequence must be simple gaseous molecules, then simple organic molecules, then complex organic molecules, then presumably a series of steps, which at the moment we cannot guess at very effectively, leading to a primitive cell. After this, organic evolution takes over and leads finally to the diversity of life which now exists. I tried to show that as soon as one goes further than this simple generalization and tries to produce a particular model, in other words, to say exactly how each of these stages occur, difficulties arise. I've also tried to present a skeptical attitude. Now, this is not because I believe the process never happened, which would be patently absurd, nor because I want to introduce some supernatural agency, but because it seems to me important that scientists should not pretend to know more than they do. To say, in effect, as some writers have, once upon a time a DNA molecule and a protein molecule met and joined together, and later on a cell was formed, and this is how it all happened, is a kind of scientific one-upmanship. We must be on our guard against this kind of thing. Now, what can we expect in the future? Obviously, more research can be done into the conditions necessary to form proteins and nucleic acids under non-biological conditions. And probably the most important information will come from natural advances in biochemistry, and in particular, from comparative biochemistry. If a reasonably complete account of the basic chemical networks, that is, the sequences and cycles of reactions controlled by enzymes present in each species could be given, we might be able to deduce which are the primitive ones. At the moment, we cannot be sure what the first organisms were like. They were presumably single-celled creatures, perhaps more simple than existing bacteria. But were they dependent on complex organic molecules for their food? That is, as they say, were they heterotropes? Or could they derive energy from some simple reaction? That is, were they autotropes? When did photosynthesis appear? Was it, as seems reasonable from its complexity, a relatively late development? Or did the earliest organisms possess a rudimentary photosynthetic apparatus? Another line of research which may bear on the origin of life problem concerns the structures of proteins. Proteins, as you will remember, contain amino acids, all of one particular handedness, joined together. There are some 20 different amino acids present in proteins, and discovering the sequence in which they are arranged has proved to be technically difficult. The problem has, at least in principle, been solved, largely due to the work of Dr. F. Sanger, and the sequences of amino acids in some proteins are now known. From the evidence at present available, 
it looks as if the sequences are such that they could have arisen by a random process. It will be interesting to see if this conclusion stands up when more results become available and if any guesses can be made about the more primitive sequences. We can expect then that as more information becomes available, better and more detailed models will be proposed for the various stages of the evolutionary process. But in terms of current theory, the overall process, that is the emergence of a living cell from the primeval soup, remains exceedingly improbable. And this is true irrespective of the details, because the driving force behind the process is only the chance combinations of a molecules occurring at random. On this view, life must be an exceedingly rare event. And the probability of its occurrence on any particular planet of any particular solar system must be very small. Suppose, however, we discover that this is not the case. It might happen that fossils will be found on the moon, that life of some kind will be found on Mars, and that the microstructures found in certain carbonaceous meteorites will turn out really to be fossils. If this happens, we shall have to think again. Now, are there any ways in which we can increase the probability of the organization of a living cell arising spontaneously from random aggregations of large molecules without invoking some unknowable vital force? I think there may be. One of the interesting features of contemporary biological research is the use of the language of information theory. This was originally used by communications engineers, but its use is now widespread in biology. In particular, one talks about information stored in DNA molecules. What exactly does this mean? It means that these molecules, which probably make up the main material of the chromosomes, control the development of a cell and determine in complicated ways which physical and chemical events are to take place. They are the organizing molecules. They impose a pattern upon the molecules with which they interact. It is obvious that such a concept is necessary in biology. The fertilized ovum of a particular animal is not in any obvious way like that animal. Yet its development will proceed along certain lines only. It contains the information characteristic of that particular kind of animal. And this information is stored in the DNA molecules. In a sense, this is a non-chemical concept. Chemists do not use it in discussing the reaction of small molecules. One might hold that the concept is, in principle, entirely reducible to chemical terms that the information is simply a set of properties of the molecule, properties such as distances between atoms, electric fields at particular points, and so on. This may be. But the important point is that it seems to be possible to discover what the information contained in particular DNA molecules is, and to decipher the coding of that information without knowing the fundamental quantities, such as interatomic distances and so on, upon which the information presumably ultimately rests. The properties of nucleic acids are still imperfectly known. It may well be that we shall find that because these molecules, wherever they arise, contain a store of information, the probability of organized chemical reactions arising in their presence is greater than we think. If this turns out to be so, we shall be saved the embarrassment of believing that the evolution of life was such an improbable event that we are forced to remark, as did the Duke of Wellington on another occasion, it was a damned close-run thing. <laughs>